Welcome everybody to, I think it's October 18th, Think Tank. Um, it's been a little while since we've done the last one, about a month and a half or so. Um, this is a little bit new because the last year or so, we, well, first of all, let me say who I am. I'm Dr. Murad Abel and I'm um, the research fellow uh, for Forbes School of Business, but uh, I have other research fellow colleagues, but I particularly am the one who runs the Think Tank and the uh, Ashford Creative Scholarship blog, which, uh, which the link is inside of the chat room. Um, so please share that with your students and you know other people even ex most of the stuff that go or everything that's on there's external facing so you certainly can share it but it's also very wonderful for our students to see what we do right we are we are an institution and we actually do research and creative scholarships so i think it's fantastic if we share that uh with people and let them know sometimes our students think because we're online um, we don't do all that stuff and, and really we are we're, we're those type of research and faculty members that do those things and we also do grants you know we do we have the ufp grants every year that we do and uh, we have a sabbatical program so if you you won a sabbatical last year you know please shoot me an email because uh, you owe me a think tank and probably a paragraph of what happened um, so i can kind of um, post you somewhere you know on the blog or here or somewhere else um Okay, so without, so and if anybody has any questions or wants to host anything on the Think Tank, that would be great. Just email me. I will put that, um, I will put that in the chat room, but that's also M-U-R-A-D period A-B-E-L at ashford.edu. Uh, there might be some external facing people that uh, may, want, may want to contact me for whatever reason. I would like in the future as professors here, we may have some students, by the way. So we've been, originally this was kind of just a Forbes thing. Then it became an Ashford thing, and now it's kind of open to students that um, that are on here. So let me say this: if there's any research that now that you know, we have kind of the doctoral stuff going on and the master's level stuff going on, if there's any students that want to present their research, you know, let's say, uh, or who is working with another faculty member doing research, let me know. Maybe we could figure something out. It'd be kind of cool to have uh, have uh, have a couple students come on with their professor or something like that. Um, that'd be kind of cool but uh we'll take it as it comes so without further ado um i'm going to let um i'm going to let the person that we're hosting today take over and say what they got to say go ahead kelly you got it on mute on yep. mute I'm okay, on great. thank you thanks so much introduce yourself there we go yep Hi, I'm Dr. Kelly Olson Stewart, and really excited to be here. I am the program chair for the Master of Arts in Education, fondly known as MADE, and my colleague is here with me. Hi, everybody. I'm Alan Belcher, uh, professor over in the uh, MADE program. So we're going to talk a little bit. Um, we're, we'll walk you through this slideshow. We're just going to share our insights and experience in creating this UFP study that we received this year. Um, we're about to go and present it in November. So this is a good dry run for us. And um, just would love to get your insights, uh, your feedback, uh, considerations as we move forward, thinking about what's the next iteration of this study. And so I'm gonna switch my screen here and share the PowerPoint. Alan and I will talk through it and then feel free to put things in the chat. One of us will grab that. And then we do have a place for questions for sure at the end. PSC to begin with. Alan, are we good? Oh, we see the, the background. You need to start the slideshow. Oh, I did. Okay, let me. <laughs> that or you shared the wrong screen. Okay, hang on. Sorry. It worked a minute ago. Technology changes everything. Right. It happens all the time. I wouldn't worry about it at all. How about that? Looks good. All right, so um, Alan and I in, in the MADE program, along with our amazing additional colleagues, uh, Julie Adkins, Kathleen Pierce Friedman, and Jackie Kiger, have really been having this ongoing conversation about our associate faculty. And we have nearly 300 associate faculty 
within the College of Ed, about 100 of those are associate faculty specifically for MAID. And our attrition rate of that group is about 25%. Some of those are um, for self-selected out. Uh, you know, these are folks that are oftentimes working multiple jobs, uh, may be retirees, have lots of other things in their lives, and Ashford may or may not be a fit. And certainly we're always watching our student success rates and our student attrition rates. And what we kept coming back to in our discussions was this idea around consistency. So you have control over your classes um, and the experience that your students have when they're with you as a full-time faculty and the amount of time that you can pour into those courses. Um, but we were concerned and wondering about what it took to feel like you were invested as an associate faculty member with specifically with MAID. And then also how can we ensure that our students have the same high quality experience that we want in every single course that they take. So, I think somebody's not muted. Just so you just you may want to just be aware in case your dog starts barking, which mine usually does. Um, our previous UFP study um, was around the idea of the entire College of Ed associate faculty. So in 2018, we surveyed the entire 300 associate faculty members to get their input about what was important to them about being part of this community and how do, they, um, how do we ensure that they feel supported. So these are just the like nutshell conclusions of that information. They asked for ongoing professional development. They wanted um, an ongoing and purposeful and relevant communication. They were really looking to connect and that meant connecting with somebody else in the college as well as other associate faculty members. They wanted to know each other. Uh, they wanted clarity around the expectations around uh, the 12 hours for associate faculty that we are um, is that we're asking them in their contract and overall like the bottom line came down to relationships and wanting TLC they wanted to be feel like they were cared for that they were honored for their expertise that they brought and that they had somebody a person that they knew that they could go to if they had questions or just wanted to sort of debrief what was happening in their courses so with all of that in mind, we created this study, and these were our three research questions. So what constitutes a relevant online community specific for MAID associate and full-time faculty? To what extent do the efforts of the MAID program generate a community feel? So we had already been trying to do some things and we wanted to see if that was being reflected in the feeling piece for them and their engagement. And what so what additional specific actions can we take to build a professional online learning community? So we gathered data really from three different areas. The first was that we had a, another survey. Connie just asked about the one from 2018. This is a, a second follow-up survey specific to our faculty in the master's program. And we wanted to know in this survey their perceptions of how they felt that they fit within the program if they understood things like who the program chair was, who's the dean, how does their course fit into the entirety of, of the program in which they're teaching. Uh, we wanted to know their perception of the current uh, professional development that was available to them through Ashford. And what, if anything, they already knew about professional learning communities. Did, did they think that was a valuable thing? Did they wanna be part of one and all that sort of thing. So I'll show you those survey questions and some results from that here in just a moment. But we also gathered a bunch of uh, quantitative, or excuse, yeah, quantitative data uh, on faculty performance. We had all of the IQR scores uh, for our faculty. We had the end of course surveys from student perceptions. We also had the FSDA scores uh, section by section for all of these faculty. Along with that, then we had the course completion rate section by section uh, for the previous four quarters. Now we compiled all this data thinking, you know, this would be a great way to look at all of our faculty, and yeah. certainly it would be. But the results that we got from the survey uh -huh. led us kind of off in a different direction than where we thought we might end up going. So uh, we, I don't want to say we ignored these quantitative measures of faculty performance, but we, in effect, we did because we think we'll come back to that later. But the, the results we got from the survey were just so informative 
that we went down that path. So these are uh, the questions that we asked in the survey, and you'll see that some of these are about um, communication with associate faculty and back from associate faculty. Uh, we want to know how they fit. D did they know, for instance, um, who their lead faculty was? We have a lead, and we have a faculty member, full-time faculty member, who's identified as the lead faculty for each of the courses in the program. And they're supposed to get an email welcome, welcoming them to the course each time it starts. Of course, we know we get one from the FSDA person as well. So um, all of those things to, to find out if faculty felt like they were really a part of our organization. We want them to be connected. We also ask them how, you know, what were their perceptions of how we were doing uh, with, with some of these things? What would make for a good professional learning community for our associate faculty? And then basically, what could we do differently? What, what do we need to do for you that we're not doing right now? So those are the, the types of questions that we ask, and we got some, uh, some interesting results from those. So for this particular survey, we only had a 30% response rate, which was a little bit disappointing, but you know, I guess it wasn't disastrously bad. Um, but the associate faculty tell us that almost all of them realize that they get an, an email from the FSDA person every time a course starts, 90 some percent. So that's a good number. But only 70% of these folks think they get an email from the course lead when they start their course. Now we think we send them out 100% of the time. So somewhere, you know, we don't know yet. Maybe uh, they don't, maybe they ignore the email. Maybe they don't know that they're getting this email from the person who is identified as course lead. You know, there's a couple of things that could have gone wrong there. Interestingly now, half of the folks thought that having a valid online professional learning community was, was important, that that was a good idea but only a fourth of them think we do that very well. So that kind of said to us, hey, what we're doing is not exactly what these people feel like they need or want. So we've got a little work to do there. Uh, just over half of the people knew who the program chair was. That may or may not be important, but it's part of knowing how I fit in with the organization. I mean, who am I answering to ultimately? And if our, if our associate faculty don't really know that, then you know, we tend to think, and, and the previous research that we reviewed would suggest that they don't feel like they're a part, they're not as engaged, they're not as invested, that sort of thing. And um, just over a third knew who even the associate dean was, which, again, you know, that, that's part of the belongingness. Um, sadly, just over half of the folks felt like their ideas for improving things weren't being heard. So those numbers overall, mostly, at least to me, are a bit disappointing, but it tells us some things that we need to do. Uh, and to address those things, Kelly has, will tell you some things that we've already done and some things that we have plans uh, yet to do. Someone? So Besides, of course, jumping into the literature, and I just had the aha that we, are, that we don't have our literature slide here. However, we do have our references at the end for anyone who's interested. Um, but one of the things that came up in the literature was this feeling of connectedness, which then equates to a, a willingness or an effort level in the course. So when you feel connected and engaged, you put more forth more effort into the course, which ultimately benefits students. So that was kind of our, the general gist of the literature that we were going with. And so again, uh, when we jumped into the, our qualitative information, a lot of this was confirmed from the study before. It wasn't you know, revolutionary from the year before, but remember that the 2018 survey was 300 associate faculty within the College of Ed, all in very different programs, different program chairs, different experiences. Um, this is specific for master, our, the Master of Arts in Education. So our small group of 100, and this is some of the ideas, or these are some of the ideas that were generated from their qualitative um, insights and feedback and things that they wanted. 
So something that was really important to them was an, simply an org chart. And of course, as things shift around in the college, we have to update that. But we were able to then just send out to the entire group an org chart has pictures on it. So you can identify by, by face, which is lovely. Um, and just put that in a regular email correspondence to the made associate faculty. Something else that was confusing to them is this idea of what the course sequence is. So when you are an associate faculty member and you teach one course or maybe two courses, and sometimes they're across programs, you really don't have a sense for students what their course experience is like, if this is a core course, if this is a specialization course. And because we have a number of those in made, um, and some of them have been coming and going, it has, it's confusing. And sometimes it's confusing to us, right? So it's really confusing if you are an associate faculty member. And so we'll take a look at what that, that looks like. It's just very simple. Um, additionally, this who's who. So a database that we created, another survey for these made associate faculty actually got a better response because uh, in this case, I think we maybe articulated more clearly that this survey was in response to specifically what the associate faculty and maid were looking for. They wanted to know what, what other uh, folks were around them, like who was their neighbor who also might teach for Ashford, uh, where did we live in the United States, and uh, additionally, what is our area of research, and what's your colleague's area of research, and are there some partnership opportunities? Um, so we'll take a look at that. Um, additionally, we talk a lot about, we infuse this idea of this graduate readiness module to help our students be more prepared for the graduate experience. MADE was one of the first uh, programs to infuse the graduate readiness modules. This is a set of videos and interactives that help uh, graduate students experience all that Ashford provides for them, the supports that are available. That was just infused into our first course, which is the EDU 650 course. And so they wanted to know what that was like. And I think looking at the infographic that goes along with that supports their understanding of um, getting students the foundations for success. And then just regular made updates. So we always juggle, like I'm sure most of you do, this idea of how much is too much communication so that you delete an email and how much is just enough. So that Goldilocks uh, place of communication which is really hard because we're finding it's very different from, for different folks. And it depends on their level of engagement and their level of time. And so we are trying lots of different ways to get their attention and get information that's relevant out. So let's just take a peek at a couple of these. So this was like one of the most exciting, I know it's really simple and, um, and a little bit like, really that's a big deal, but for us it was very exciting. So let me uh, scroll out here as soon as it's fully loaded. Essentially, this is a Google map. As the associate faculty filled out their survey, we then plotted them on the map, we're able to share the map, and so we can zoom in. So let's just, I'll pick on Phoenix since I'm outside of Phoenix. We then, I could tell here who is in my backyard. So this is, this is Yvette. She's an associate faculty member in the East Valley. She put her picture in. There's me in Goodyear. And what happened is literally as I was plotting these associate faculty on the map, I found out that within 15 minutes, I have another associate faculty member, Diane Hall. We met for coffee, uh, certainly have communicated via email, but had no idea that we were in proximity that close. And so this was just shared out, I've gotten great response from folks. Um, you know, we can create our own little meetups. There's lots of East Coast folks, lots of, Lisa, there's lots of Florida people here. Um, but just to give people an opportunity, they can engage by putting their own picture in here. They can put notes if they want, um, or certainly just check who's near them. I know when I was traveling um, this past two weekends ago, I was back in the Midwest and I was taking a peek at if there was anybody who happened to be near me. Um, so I actually have met Eileen because she's in my hometown. So it's, something simple um, was really relevant. Let me go back to... So this database, simply uh, again from the Google survey, we created this database. 
it gives people's work experience, their area of expertise, and additionally, their area of research. And so again, all information that was shared specifically by the associate faculty member, but again, helps us make connections. In fact, I know one of our um, full-time faculty members, uh, Dr. Pierce Friedman, just did a study with Tony Goss, who's one of our associate faculty members, uh, found a research connection, they wrote a chapter together. So another opportunity just to, to really get to know each other a little bit better. In this way is a static way, but again, um, it, ha it provides a, at least a database or an archive with more information than we had before we started. And then this is very simple. It's just the course sequence. And again, it's just the understanding of what our core courses are, what our specialization courses are, and then what that capstone is. And again, if you teach EDU 588 in the middle of the higher ed specialization, you have no understanding when we're referencing all these numbers um, or courses where your course falls in the middle of that. So very simple. And then I'll let you take a look here. Again, this is nothing fancy, but trying to come up with all different ways to connect with our associate faculty. Hi, Maynard. There's me on our made fall update. It's gotten 22 views, so you know three of them might be Alan and I. But um, again, trying to connect that I'm the program chair for made, the team, all the folks who are on it, and that we're providing information ongoing. Um, this is a very simple video format. I think in the middle of it, uh, something goes wrong. Like my dog is my, you can there, sense the theme here of the puppy, super obnoxious barking or something. Multiple faculty though, emailed me back and commented and said, oh my gosh, that was so great. Um, I've always worried that everything needs to be perfect when I do my videos. And you know, we keep saying there's lots of ways to reach out and the, the real and the vulnerable uh, is appealing to folks, students and other faculty. So again, we don't have the, the silver bullet, the magic. Uh, we're just trying to figure out how to make our uh, uh, made associate faculty really feel a part of an online community and thinking about what additional ideas or strategies. This is simply an infographic that we created that just highlights that. So again, highlights kind of the big ideas for developing a virtual PLC. We have the database, clarity around the people, um, ongoing updates from the college as well as from specific for our program, um, a question and answer hub. So we're in the midst of creating a Canvas made associate faculty course that has all of our core courses in one location and one Canvas course will allow folks to interact with others who teach that same course um, and also poke around and see if there's, you know, there's overlapping ideas, uh, overlapping associate faculty, a place to talk about how to further engage students, you know, all of those kind of common announcements. <laughs> and then the heart of it is, goes back to still TLC. Associate faculty, as long with, along with all of us, want to make sure that they feel like they're being cared for, that they're connected, and that they have other folks, their colleagues that they uh, are able to talk with and share ideas with. Okay, so um, thinking now ahead for us and with you all, uh, we are really interested in finding out for our own benefit and for future studies possibly uh, your experience or understanding of virtual uh, PLCs, professional learning communities, and other suggestions for how we can uh, better connect with our remote faculty. Uh, I've been watching the chat over here, Kelly, and talking about you in case you weren't watching that while it was going on. But um, one of the things in particular, that, and Kelly mentioned this a moment ago, is how do we give, uh, how do we know with our associate faculty, just how much information they need and want, and when does it get to be just too much and they start to ignore it and delete it. So we would love to hear your uh, comments, questions, ideas on these or other things uh, connected to uh, virtual learning communities. Alan, I, fantastic. Kelly, fantastic. I, I really love what you guys did. 
Um, you know, I've noticed, I've been at this university, I don't know, seven or eight years now as a full-timer and a couple, you know, number of years before that as a, as a associate faculty member. And I've got to say, we've, as far as online and online universities go, I mean, even though we still have a campus and stuff, we, uh, we really excel at trying to, to sort of bridge the gap in the online world and draw in our associate faculty um, to work with our full timers. We do, like I said, we do, this is a research tank, think tank. So we do some research where we allow, you know, faculty to, associate faculty to collaborate with full time faculty. We've got you guys, you know, making up, you know, and creating these types of things which draw them in. We've put them on, you know, our, um, we put representatives on our, our um, Senate, faculty Senate, and we, we keep doing all that wonderful things. And I know, you know, as somebody who does some administration in, in our work here, um, you know, we have our own faculty we deal with. So, I mean, there's always that balance. We're trying to connect with them, but not over connect. We forget that sometimes even though we want to connect, um, that, they, they, that they, some of these people might only teach one or two classes a year and they don't want 16 emails uh, this month. Right. So, but I, and especially if they're junk, generic emails, like, and I, I don't want to call them junk, but you know, generic emails, like come and check this out and come and check that out. Um, I've, I've learned that personalization is a huge factor um, when you're connecting with this, with the faculty, right? Because when you personalize, uh, even though the message might be similar for most of the faculty members, you're saying, hey, Tom, or hey, Kelly, or hey, Alan, why don't you show up, you know, here's something for you if you need it. Uh, and I think that makes the difference, not only in this, but as a marketing professor in marketing as well, right? We always delete the generic emails. My question is, I do have a question here. Um, so in that balance, did you guys ever consider having like an internal page that faculty members could click on to find all the updates and their programs? Um, you know, the, the org chart could be up there. It's specifically for your college or your department or, or whatever. Do you guys ever think of or considering that? And that way people can update themselves. And when something's really important, you can send them out an email and, and they're not being overwhelmed. You're getting through the, you know, you can get through the noise. Um, yeah, thanks, Mirad, for all of that. We actually started, um, maybe two months ago, a Canvas course called COE 101, which the primary, the original purpose for that was to um, help all of our associate faculty understand the various criteria on the IQR rubric, and so that they could work toward becoming distinguished on that rubric. So uh, we have weekly discussions on there that's open for people that wanna drop in and learn what their colleagues are doing. So we're doing that. Now, as part of that, then we've discovered also, hey, we can post other stuff out there for folks to drop in and get it when they want it. We also are noticing though that each, um, each academic program is developing its own lounge of sorts, um, which is good because that, you know, that puts things in smaller groups and people are able to, to connect with folks that have comparable interests. But uh, yeah, we, uh, I think having all of that information in a central place is, is, uh, is perfect for our folks. Yeah, and, and, and I don't think, you know, it's great to do something like that university-wide, but, but if you're connecting with your faculty that have your interests, it's a little bit different because you want to be able to make it, um, you want to make it homey, if that makes any sense. But, you know, let's say Alan gets a promotion or Kelly gets a promotion or this happens. It's a great place to stick that stuff. An associate faculty does some research. We could always post a link of it up there, right? And it's just kind of getting that conversation and who you can contact and you're and creating that online sense of community. Uh, that could be difficult, but I think you guys are on the right yeah. track, that's for sure. Well, then I think also then uh, that people have to remember that that resource is there um, because, you know, we've got lots of resources here available to us as full-time faculty. When was the last time any of us dropped into the CEDL pages, for instance? Yeah, yeah. You know, some of you maybe do that regularly, but I'd be willing to bet a lot of us don't. I know no, I, we I'm don't. Not, I'm not a regular visitor. 
Well, I think we're hoping that with Canvas, because you're already in your Canvas courses anyway, like Alan and I had a Weebly site, which we housed all of the announcements specific for, for our courses, as well as all the sort of, I call them generic announcements, the library, writing center, all of the great stuff for students um, that you just post that announcement each, each course. But it was one more place that our faculty would have to bookmark, right? To go, where was yeah. that page again and what was it? So we're hoping, and again, this is sort of like, the next iteration of the study are are the videos working are the welcome there's a welcome video that comes when you are teaching are, are those making an impact um, and does the canvas faculty lounge for made is that helping you to feel connected to be informed you know to kind of hit all of those marks for those folks who are really interested in creating that professional online learning community you know, Lisa has something to say here, but let me let me also add to you, and I agree with you from as a business professor, when you have kind of changes and growth and things that have happened, everybody has a good idea. They start the idea and then it just sort of sits out there and becomes useless. So somebody at some point will have to coordinate uh, and come back. I guess it's the same way with government too, right? Yeah. Somebody's got to coordinate somewhere and go back and look at all that stuff and say, hey, um, we don't need that, or that's confusing, nobody really uses it, nobody cares about it. I understand that it's in your group and we don't manage it, but can we start deleting these things out? And so that we have sort of focus so people can find what they need. Because honestly, if I look at three places looking for a social community, right, and, and no, no, there's nothing happening in each one and nobody's updated it in three years, uh, it's probably time, I mean, this is every organization, just, Let's, but you got to clean it up and get rid of it. Okay, there was a there was a question, um, and I think it was Lisa at Allen. Lounges like LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups are dead spaces. Can do more to demotivate. Okay, so that kind of fits into what I was saying a little bit. That sometimes these places become dead spaces, and we should just sort of get rid of them. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. I got, and I agree. Overwhelming students. You know, and that was the other thing as research fellows we tried to avoid is that everybody wanted to do studies on students, right? Because they're the, and that's every university, very convenient sample. But you know, we have to, and, and everyone wants to do study with associate faculty. And, and so we want good ones, good studies like this to go through, but you know, some studies that maybe are not fully thought out, we don't want to overwhelm the faculty either. Otherwise, when we have important studies, we can't get, we can't get the information because they've been desensitized. It's the noise, right? It's the online noise. Um, here's a comment here. Let me see. Here's a comment about they're just saying they like what you guys are doing and you're doing a great job. Kudos. They might consider doing it themselves. Love the map idea. Does anybody have any additional? I think I've kind of hit some of the big ones here. Anybody have any additional questions? Um, I'll scroll down to the bottom, type it in now, and I will, or retype it if I didn't say it. Okay, so someone asked, can we e export this to somewhere else? Yeah, you know what, we're gonna actually create a recording out of it, um, get it through the review, and then people could, um, then it'll be external facing, and if not, it'll be internal facing, and you guys can, you know, I'll try and send around an email. So if you really, really want this video, Send me an email so I can put you on a little list somewhere. And then when the video comes out, I can share it with you. Uh, Lisa asked if we have any specific focus for 2020 in following up on this research. And we don't yet. We want, we want to um, let people know, uh, our associate faculty, that we've heard what they've said so far. And here's what we've done as a result of that, hoping that we get broader input from folks because we know we haven't hit everyone's needs out there yet. Uh, so we will probably somewhat duplicate this next year, but thinking about here's what we've done now, where do we go next? Yeah. Florence, Florence says, no questions. Ashford does a great job at supporting faculty. Thank you, Florence. Oh, some, uh, Lisa said, I would like to see some, uh, uh, she uses big words and, and I don't even, even as a doctor, I don't quite pronounce them correctly. So anyways, data approaches for small versus uh, versus large programs of OSAPRA and impact your method. So I, can you see it? Because I can't pronounce that. So if you can see it, just answer the question. <laughs> okay. 
Well, I, I don't. Uh, Alan, Lisa, I'm just going to come on and ask. So the question is, are you looking at the differences between the small programs like MSIDT the, and Macy the, and the ones in the college that have just launched that are growing your program, as well as the differences in these strategies for those faculty aligned to large full courses versus DS courses? I think um, that could be really valuable as a data point, not only for me in my own practice, um, Dr. Sorensen and I in our program, but generally, because we do have that sort of segregation. We have large classes and we have really small classes. Um, well, it's funny that you should ask that question, Lisa. We've actually, over here in the College of Ed, we've done four different studies on um, building virtual PLCs. Uh, we've done them in the MADE. We've talked about it in the ECE programs and those for everyone else. Those are our largest programs over here in the College of Ed. But we've also done them in the... Um, English language learner program, which is one of the smaller programs. And we will be compiling all of that into one uh, hopefully readable article in the very near future. Okay, we got a lot of, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, last chance, last questions. And then, uh, like I said, if you, if you want this video, you can email um, Kelly or Alan or myself because obviously they're going to get the link too so and one of us will send it to you when it's available it, it honestly it takes about three weeks though because I, I got to find the time to create it and get it through all the review process so okay thank you everybody I'm going to stop recording if there's something you want to say after the recording you can certainly hang out for a second and do that